Hi, I'm Jenny Bavage. I teach English literature here at the Institute of Continuing Education. I teach 19th century, 20th century and contemporary literature, poetry, environmental criticism, children's literature. I have a big range of interests. Uh, I'm about to start teaching with my certificate class students a course on the 19th century novel. And I've been setting them some quite hefty reading challenges. So this term, they're going to be reading long novels like Middle March by George Eliot, Jude the Obscure by Thomas Hardy, uh, Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Most people join our courses because they love the absorption of a long read and the challenge of encountering unusual or challenging language and narrative. But maybe even we diehards who come to sessions like this or who join courses like mine have a nagging feeling that our attention spans are being challenged by the pressures of the digital world and the distractions of social media. Those of us who grew up before the world went online may find ourselves lecturing the younger generation about their styles of communication and their perceived or actual reluctance to read in the same way that we did and to find ourselves bemoaning the speed and shallowness of online culture. But pretty much since its rise in the 18th century, people have been keen to declare that the novel is dead and that current readers aren't able to read at length. This idea that the, the novel is dead and people aren't reading is not a new one. In 2014, after the internet took over the world, but before it was in our pockets, Will Self, the British novelist, wrote an essay titled, The Novel is Dead and This Time It's For Real. Well, just over 10 years on, the novel is still with us, but there are concerns about whether people are still reading at length and in depth. And these debates continue. In an interview in, uh, for Bomb BBC Radio in June 2022, children's writer Jacqueline Wilson talked about the destruction of children's reading stamina by the instant gratification of video games and apps like TikTok and other social media. She, she went a step further from the familiar recitation of such fears by suggesting that this tendency is being reflected in children's books themselves. So she says, look at TikTok and how quick and immediate it is. And she suggests that the style of children's writing now has begun reflecting that style of uh, quick TikTok communication. She says, that a lot of children's books that are good and popular are quite slight. You can read them quite quickly. There's no real depth to them. Now, even adults concerned about children growing up in a distracting and a distracted world will recognize that weird nudge we all have to reach for our little companions, the, the new demons in our pockets. I know that I have to consciously leave my screen reading state of mind when I want to read at length deeply and absorb absorbedly. Maybe Gen X is actually better at coping with the new forms of literacy that are coming into being. They may de be developing what uh, cultural critic uh, Marianne Wolfe calls biliterate brains. That is brains that know when it's time to switch into deep reading mode from the surface skimming reading for information that we have to use to operate in a digital world. And even though we may as a culture feel that our attention span is diminished by the effects of social media, we know that young people are still reading. Uh, this uh, new phenomenon of book talk is incredibly popular. It has united millions of young readers across the world in a kind of rolling global book club. Uh, maybe you're a member yourself. Users recommend and review books, often engaging in debate about the quality and the value of the reading, passionately defending their favorites. And a particular effect of BookTok is the creation of viral book hits, sometimes of unexpected and quite challenging books like Wuthering Heights or The Song of Achilles. Uh, one body which follows how pub where publication trends are going, BookScan, um, keeps an eye on US sales. And they estimate that 20 million books have been sold as a direct result of BookTok's ground up viral marketing. So we know that people are still reading. Uh, there might be questions about what they're reading and what genre they're reading in. And what's fascinating is that the kind of objections that we began with from Will Self or Jacqueline Wilson have also been around 
pretty much as long as there have been books and readers. So people worrying about what people are reading and how they're reading. There might be worries about the content or worries about the kind of technologies of reading, or the two might be bound together. And this fear goes a really long way back. Let me take you all the way back to the 16th century when the index was invented. I would really recommend this much more interesting than it sounds book by Dennis Duncan, Index, A History of the, which talks about the technology of the index, which was invented to help a reader find a particular point in a text. And uh, Duncan quotes a commentator, Conrad Gessner, writing in 1548, who's worried that the index, the invention of the index, is going to make readers lazy. He talks about how the carelessness of some who rely only on the indexes and do not read the complete text of their authors in their proper order and methodically means that people are not reading in the way that they should. He says this is not the fault of the texts, but the problem with this new technology of the index. So given that technology has come a long way since people began worrying that indexes were making us lazy, how is the novel faring? in the age of short, sharp communication, which thrives in the internet age. There's a long history of brevity, of shortness in literary history, of course. Short or condensed forms have their own kinds of genres. We could think about uh, the alivening effects of shortness in all sorts of genres, aphorisms, parables, short stories, flash fiction, and the myriad of short verse from haiku to sonnet. Lydia Davis, uh, an American writer, for example, is a writer of very short stories. Here are two. Notes during long phone conversation with mother. For summer she needs pretty dress, cotton, cotton. No, and then I can't really read the rest of it aloud because it becomes a kind of doodle, a playing around with language, a playing around with the idea of cotton. But at the same time, there's a story behind this of the speaker of this story and the conversation with their mother, the fact that this is a long phone conversation. So in the gaps of this story, there's something happening, which we as readers fill in. Here's another example of Lydia Davis's very short story, stories, The Outing. An outburst of anger near the road, a refusal to speak on the path, a silence in the pine woods, a silence across the old railroad bridge, an attempt to be friendly in the water, a refusal to end the argument on the flat stones, a cry of anger on the steep bank of dirt, a weeping among the bushes. Again, here brevity is a virtue. This story asks us to fill in a lot of blanks. We don't know who these people are, we don't know what the argument is about, but we do know that something has happened and there's a story around this. Perhaps you already have an image in your mind of the place where this is taking, that the events of this story are taking place. We've got uh, an image from our last story of a telephone conversation and now a walk in the woods, question about who's shouting at whom and why. They're very short narratives, but they also ask us about the nature of narrative, what the story of an argument is or a telephone call how these ordinary incidents might reveal a whole life and set of relationships. Davis was writing these kind of very short, short stories long before the arrival of seven second videos and vines or tweets. Her work owes more to the modernist fragment than the digital age meme. The shortness here speaks of difficulty in communicating and the limits of language but they're like little trapdoors into much deeper reading experiences. Some contemporary writers have begun to experiment with delivering long narratives within the short spaces of Twitter. So uh, David Mitchell or Jennifer Egan have tried that form to deliver stories um, within. Um, and contemporary novelists, I'm quoting here from a, a critic called Human Barakat, writing about the way that contemporary novelists might be bringing the style of writing that we find on social media or on screen into the work themselves. He talks about a mode of writing that's coming into being that sort of brings the digital age onto the page. Uh, so uh, new, bits of news media, nuggets of culture, new two clips or gifs and tweets in a kind of he, he talks about a, a novel which would have the form of a flickering attention span, 
a narrative structure that plays out like the tabs on a web browser. And he says that that's necessary for our reading. Um, it's something that we need both to reflect our world and to explore it. We've seen Jennifer Egan uh, in a visit from the Goon Squad, having a whole chapter styled like a PowerPoint uh, presentation, for example. So she uses uh, the style of a, uh, the, the information presentation you get in a presentation like the one I'm giving you here. Um, but within it, she says profound things about her characters. Uh, in these two examples, Lincoln is trying to say to his dad uh, profound things about their relationship, but she presents it in this graphic form, walking to the car, uh, the conversation that the father and the son have spread out like this on a chart. So novelists are experimenting with brevity. They're using the forms of social media and digital life and on-screen life to still talk about the things that we found are, that we'll find our novelists in the 19th century talking about love, relationships, money, power, society. It's all still being talked about, but just in these slightly different forms. And literary criticism is there to chart those changes, to get into those questions and to just explore and discuss them with each other. If you join our courses uh, this year, uh, we'll be inviting you to read long texts like Shakespeare plays, or we've got a really long novel on the American literature course uh, on the certificate, uh, Melville's Moby Dick, which is one of the, the real whales of literary history. We'll invite you to explore the richness and the complexity of medieval literature and 18th century literature on the diploma. But we'll also be looking at a lot of short forms too short poetry in the in the certificate, short stories too. And in my course on adaptation and literature on the diploma, we look at all sorts of adaptations from film and television to visual art, all forms which have looked at the lengthy texts of literary history and thought about how they might be adapted or changed for new audiences. And I think at heart, that's what I really love about literary criticism, about reading still for myself and reading with students and fellow readers. It's about thinking about where literature has been, where it's at and where it's going. And I find those questions tremendously exciting.